we're going to talk about the nervous system and what makes your brain go tick, right? But it's not really only your brain, is it, right? So, so has anyone ever here seen Schoolhouse Rock? Like, you know, you guys remember those old like Schoolhouse Rock things? They had like the Constitution, they had one of like adverbs and adjectives. If you haven't seen it, there's a fantastic Schoolhouse Rock video about the nervous system. So I want you guys at home too to go look up the nervous system. Schoolhouse Rock. And you're going to hear this awesome song that goes like, there's a telegraph line, you've got yours and I've got mine. It's called the nervous system. And I'm not going to spoil it anymore, but it's a great song and it gives you a very basic rundown of what's included inside of the nervous system, right? Now, in the nervous system, obviously, we have the brain and we have the spine and we have nerves, right? Those nerves send messages throughout your entire body to regulate when you wake up, when you sleep, when you move, when you do anything, right? So the nervous system is necessarily the path of communication between the brain and the rest of the body, right? I'll tell you guys a really grim story, right? Inside of your neck, right? Here's, here's, here's your head, and here's your neck, and here's your nose, and here's your eye, right? And inside of your neck, there are these two little bones, right? And one of them is called C1, and one of them is called C2. And C2 fits into C1, and allows you to turn your head, right? And they're little spinal vertebra. So the spine, the spinal cord moves through them. They're part of the spine. When you hang someone, when someone was sentenced to death by being hanged, right? What happens is that their C2 detaches from C1 and their spinal cord gets crushed. And basically, their brain is separated from communication with the rest of their body. And they die. And that's how they die. That's how hanging works. This is called an internal decapitation. So it's not that you're decapitated from the outside like someone cut your head off, but someone removed the C1 from the C2 and now your head is dislocated from the rest of your body. That would kill you in 99% of instances. There, are, there is like one case study I read of an internal decapitation by a car accident where a kid was brought into like a neurosurgeon, neurosurgeon who like reattached his fucking dens and axis. And like it was ridiculous, it was crazy but normally that'll kill you. So that should show you how important the spinal cord is, right? It is the way that we get messages from command central to the rest of the body, right? And when you are in medical school, right, you will have the honor and the absolute privilege of participating in an anatomy lab, right? And in this anatomy lab, one of your labs will most certainly be called a laminectomy. It is where you take the back of the spinal cord and chop through it with a chisel and you remove the bones, right? And what you get to see is the sheath of the spinal cord. And you'll cut it open and unravel the layers until you can see the spinal cord. And it's a beautiful story of mine, which still like, kind of makes me emotional to this day. Um, there is a little device in anatomy, it's not a device, it's, it's a thing. It's like an instrument in, in anatomy lab. And it just looks like a pen. If this thing were thinner and made of metal with a little hook at the back, uh, at the back a very dull hook, that's called a probe. You just use it to move stuff around an anatomy lab. And what happens is that you can see the spinal cord, right? And it kind of looks like this. Kind of looks like this. And it has little branches going off at each level, right? And what I did is I took my probe and I snuck it under the spinal cord and I lifted it up. I just lifted the spinal cord gently with my probe, right? And at that moment, I was a 22-year-old first-year medical student sitting in a cold basement of a medical institution holding someone's fucking spinal cord in my right hand with a stainless steel device. Every single motion, and it was like down here, like their spinal cord down here. So every motion that that person had ever made with their legs, their toes, their muscles, everything they felt on their skin at that level, everything that they ever did willingly and unwillingly, every motion they ever took, every inch they ever moved, I was holding inside of my right hand. If that does not display to you how important this structure and what we're about to talk about is, I would reevaluate. Because this is important shit. And one day, some of you may become physicians who work with things as important as this. And by some of you, I mean all of you. Because one day you'll realize that everything in medicine is as important as this. Okay? So let's talk about the nervous system. 
The basic building block of the nervous system is what? Nerves, neurons, right? Neurons, okay. So these are neurons. What are they? They are cells capable of what? There's like a very specific uh, definition I have to give you here. Transmitting and translating electrical impulses into chemical signals. This is a very crude drawing of what a neuron looks like, right? And honestly, in between here, there are little spaces, right? Ninja Nerd on YouTube has a fantastic video about the nerves and the nervous system and neurons and everything we're gonna talk about. I urge you to watch his video because his illustrations are much better than mine, right? I don't care for illustrations. He does. OK. These ends of the nerve, this is a nerve cell, right? So when we talked about like differentiation, one of the cells inside of the, that like embryo we talked about prehistorically a long time ago is this. This is a neuron, right? These ends, they're called dendrites. Dendrites, D-E-N-D-R-I-T-E-S, dendrites. Right? And they receive messages from other cells. What's up, buddy? How are you? Receives messages from other cells, right? So we receive the message here. Where do you think the message goes? That way. Right? That way. This is called the cell body. It's like where all this cell HQ, it's like where the nucleus is and everything like that. So this doesn't look like your normal cell, right? But it is. So has mitochondria, so has, does all this stuff and blah, 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 whatever, right? This is just a very specialized type of cell, right? This right here is called the axon hillock. It's like where we begin to send the message, right? This stuff like this stuff surrounding the entire thing, like this cord goes through, 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 through. All this stuff surrounding the cord, this is known as myelin. M-Y-E-L-I-N, myelin. Myelin. And it's an insulating material. And these, what we call unmyelinated sections inside of the neuron, these are called the nodes of what? Nodes of what? Ranvier. Because he's French and pretentious. The nodes of Ranvier, right? This is the axon. And these are the nerve terminals or axon terminals. What does terminal mean? It means the end, right? Okay. Cool. Myelin, specifically, is produced by a type of cell called, does anyone know? They're called oligodendrocytes. So these are produced by oligodendrocytes. Interestingly enough, if you, when you get to medical school and you do histology, right, you're going to look at a cross section of a neuron that goes like this. And when you look at it, you're going to see the oligodendrocyte, and like this is the cord, and it wraps around the cord like this. It's like a spiral. 
and it makes myelin, and it makes that beefy insulation around the what? Around the little cord, around the, that part of the cell, right? The axon, around the axon. So that cord, that cord is the axon, right? And this is the axon terminal. That's the way that the signal, this is called signal propagation. You, take a photo. So the axon is surrounded by myelin on its way down to the axon terminal, right? So let's talk about it in ter the terms you need to know. This signal is received on the dendrites and transferred to the cell body before getting compiled at the axon hillock, traveling down the axon, between the nodes of Ranvier to the nerve terminal where the signal is passed on. That's what you need to know, okay? But what did I just say? The signal travels between the nodes of Ranvier. So the one thing you, I want you to really get in your head and take away from this whenever you see it, the signal doesn't travel through the axon the whole way. It jumps from node to node to node to node. It jumps, right? Why does it do that? Because it's faster than traveling down the whole thing, somehow. It's somehow faster than traveling down the whole thing. It makes all of the conduction quicker. Now, guys, this is one thing I say to all my students. Orgo, MCAT, bio, everything, physiology in, in medical school. Think of everything in science as dramatic as possibly can be. You think you know how fast this is happening? You don't. It's a thousand times faster, a million times faster. Dr. Mil I always call him Dr. Militsky. Professor Militsky once gave us an example. This is glucose, right? This is glucose. And glucose can close itself into a structure like this. And it can close itself and open itself, and close itself and open itself, and close itself and open itself. How often, I want you guys to guess, how often do you think that happens? That it closes and opens, closes and opens, right? How many times a minute does that happen? My guess was like six, seven, a billion. That's the like closer, yeah. This happens one million times per second. So 60 million times a minute. Glucose closes and opens back up. And closes and opens back up. And closes. I can't comprehend that. that. That is incomprehensible to me. I don't even know what a million of anything looks like. Right? I wish I did. Right? Because it would probably be money. But I don't know what a million of anything looks like. Right? So that is incomprehensible to me. And that is just a molecule opening and closing. This, we're talking about electrical signal conduction. This is ridiculously fast. Right? So when you're thinking about how quickly this jumps from thing to thing and how quickly this goes and like propagates the signal, which we're going to talk about in a second, it is lightning quick, okay? Because if it wasn't, you would be dead. You'd be dead, right? I, I, I tutor some of the MS1s over at Downstate, and I, I tell them like every single time I turn to them and I say, if it didn't, you'd be, they all say in unison, everyone, dead. Okay, you'd be dead, right? Okay, does everyone have that down? That's good? All right, let's keep talking. So, like I said, myelin, the biggest thing, it's an insulating material, right? So, when you talk about demyelinated sections of the axon, those are the nodes of Ranvier, which the signal can propagate down. Because what does insulation do? It stops the signal from being transmitted, right? So since the whole axon is surrounded by insulation and those specific points aren't, the signal will go through those points because it's the easiest path of conduction. Okay, cool. Neurons are not physically connected to one another. This is the axon terminal of one neuron. And I'm going to zoom in on this specific part, right? And this is going to be the dendrite of the next neuron. And I'm going to zoom in on this specific part. So this is the axon terminal. And this is the dendrite on a very, very, very microscopic level, right? What is this space 
between the two of them. This is called the synapse. The synapse. It's called the synapse, right? Or the synaptic cleft, right? Well, okay. The nerve, this is technically called the synaptic cleft. The nerve terminal plus the synaptic cleft plus the next dendrite is the synapse, right? And sometimes we say the two nerves synapse onto one another. We use it as a verb as well. They synapse onto one another, right? Okay. I don't know why they start talking about like, uh, I, yeah, I kind of get it. Okay, so we're going to come back to this, right? But I want you to know that that's how that happens. Because before we talk about signal propagation through a synapse, we need to talk about the different types of neurons and the different actions of neurons throughout the body. Everyone good? Cool. Trust me, this chapter goes quick. It, it's really short. Like the, the, all the long chapters are at the beginning. It's like, it's like the cell and the reproduction, blah, 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 whatever. These go quick, super quick. Okay. So uh, multiple neurons can be bundled together, and that's what's called a nerve, right? And you have sensory nerves, motor nerves, and mixed nerves. So they're sensory motor. Some of them are just motor. Some of them are just sensory, correct? Okay. So the central nervous system is the... If you listen to Schoolhouse Rock, the central nervous system is the brain and the spine, right? That's what it is. The central nervous system is the brain. And they say spine because they're talking to children. It's the brain and the spinal cord. That's the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system, right? The peripheral nervous system, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, right? Whenever you see CNS, PNS, that's what we're talking about. Central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. When we talk about that, the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, we're talking about the difference between the brain and the spine slash the whatever else. Anything else that exists inside of the nervous system. So all the peripheral nerves. So they make like a little note inside of the book where the, in the peripheral nervous system, all the cell bodies are like synced into ganglia and the central nervous system, they're sp split into tracks. You don't necessarily need to know that until you get to like medical school. Um, and then they talk a little bit about glial cells. Um, so glial cells are just like cells inside of the nervous system that support the nervous system and blah, 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 whatever. Um, in your books, they make a very, very specific distinction between like astrocytes, ependymal cells, microglia, blah, blah oligodendrocytes. I don't know enough about neuroanatomy yet to properly teach that. That's the second time you'll hear me say that. I'm not good enough at this stuff to teach it to you. But they're just simple facts. You look in the book, you write them down, you're good. Okay? So look in your books and just look at the cell organization of the nervous system, right? Now, this is where I start to lose people. And it's funny because the first time I ever encountered this, I was probably 16. And I'm still learning about it to this day. I still don't know everything about this. We need to talk about action potentials. Who know, ra hand, raise your hands. Who knows what, the action potential, what an action potential is? Any action potential. Who doesn't know what an action potential is? OK. So we're going to talk about action potentials in its entirety, right? So I'm going to draw a graph. And here we're going to have voltage. Because remember, the nervous system is electrical conduction. And here we're going to have time as time goes forward on the x-axis, right? So this is called an action potential. Before we do that, we need to talk about the inside and outside of a cell. Here is the cell membrane. Inside the cell, there's a collection of positive and negative charges, right? And outside the cell, there's a collection of positive and negative charges. When we speak of the voltage of the cell, what we are saying is the difference between the inside and the outside. So voltage equals in versus 
out, right? Because what is, anyone who took physics, what is voltage? It is a electrical conductive differential between two points, right? A nine volt battery, there's a nine volt difference between the positive and negative terminal of the battery, right? When we talk about voltage in the cell, we're talking about the inside versus the outside. So what we call the resting potential, the resting potential of a neuron, it's at negative 70 millivolts. Meaning that the difference in electric pressure or movement or whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, between the inside and the outside is negative 70. So is the inside more negative or more positive? The inside is more negative. Right. So that is where our action potential begins. All right. What happens is that the dendrite receives signals, right? And those signals begin to do something called depolarization. What is depolarization? It's making the cell more positive. Right, it's making the cell more positive. So as the neuron gets signals, this little slope begins to climb. Right? Okay? Yeah? You, you should be taking this graph down, by the way. This graph we're gonna build on. And it's gonna climb until it reaches something known as what? Does anyone know? The point of no return? It's called threshold potential. So I'm gonna write A, and here I'm gonna write A. This is threshold potential. And this might not make a lot of sense right now, it might be just gibberish, but wait, we'll put it all together at the end. Threshold potential is at roughly what? Negative 50 millivolts. Negative 50 millivolts is threshold potential. Why is it called threshold potential? It's because at this point, there's no more going back. A full action potential will be realized, right? So in this segment, we're gonna call this segment one, right? And we're gonna explain it later. That's segment one, all right? At threshold potential, we're gonna climb, we're gonna reach an apex, we're gonna come back down, and we're gonna come back to here. That is the whole action potential over time. And now we need to explain what happens at each and every single one of these points, okay? Don't get nervous. This is two, and this is like what? Positive 35, right? This is section three. And this part right here is section four. Section four is really important, right? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna explain those different sections of the graph, right? So section one is, and what, what neuron are we talking about here? Which one? Are we talking about the one that's receiving the signals or are we talking about the one that's sending the signals? We're talking about the one that's receiving them, right? So it all starts, let's say that this is the neuron, right? And this is the axon, and this is its terminals, right? It all starts with receiving signals where? Receiving signals on the dendrites, right? So as it receives signals on the dendrites, those signals begin to depolarize the neuron, meaning that it's becoming more positive, right? Depolarization makes the cell membrane more, or the cell more positive, right? And more positive means that there's less negative charges with respect to the outside, or there's more positive charges with respect to the outside. Are you guys following? Yeah? So number one is excitatory. Excitatory because we go in the positive direction, right? Signals from the, or sorry, not from the, like it could be from another neuron or it could be from the brain or whatever, right? Excitatory signals begin to act on the dendrites and depolarize, make positive, the neuron. And this leads us to threshold potential.
That brings us to threshold potential. And once we're at threshold potential, there's no going back. The full action potential, will, it's all or nothing, right? So if you don't reach threshold potential, it's nothing. If you do reach threshold potential, you go. Does that make sense? Cool. Section two. If threshold potential is reached, if threshold potential is reached, voltage gated sodium channels open and allow sodium influx. Allow sodium influx. What does influx mean? Influx means things entering the cell, right? So sodium is what, positive or negative? Positive, it's an ion, right? It's a positive ion, or what we call a cation, right? So those cations, and why, okay, so break it down with me. Voltage-gated sodium channel. It is a channel that does not open until a certain voltage is reached. What do you think that voltage is? Threshold potential, right? Okay, so until we're at negative 50 millivolt, that's the worst 50 I've ever drawn in my life. Until we're at negative 50 millivolts, those channels don't open. And once we're at negative 50 millivolts, remember, it's dramatic. They completely open up. And sodium's just allowed to flood into the cell. Why does it go in and not out? It's because the concentration of sodium outside the cell is far higher than inside the cell, right? And it's just following laws of diffusion. The moment you open those channels, it's gonna flood into the cell. It's just gonna completely, completely destroy the inside of that cell, right? That's how it happens, okay? So when it's allowed to do so, it will go. And after some time, it will close, right? And the sodium channels, I want you to write, I'm not gonna put this on the board, but write it down. The sodium channels are quick to close. They are quick to close, right? Because the third step is that voltage-gated potassium channels open and permit potassium efflux. What is efflux? Movement out. Why is potassium moving out? Well, number one, the potassium concentration inside the cell is far higher than the concentration outside the cell. So it's just following simple laws of diffusion. That's number one. Number two, the inside of the cell is now positive. So you can imagine that there's an electro-repulsive electro force that forces positive charges out of the cell. Now, why doesn't the sodium leave? Well, that's because the sodium channels are closed now, right? But the potassium channels are open. So those electro-repulsive forces push the potassium out of the cell. Does that make sense? Remember that for things to leave and enter the cell, you need a channel, unless you're just allowed to passively go through. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, so voltage-gated potassium channels open and permit the potassium efflux. Why? Because the potassium concentration inside the cell is far higher than that outside the cell. And number two, there is a much, look, the inside the cell, what's the voltage right now? Positive 35 millivolts. What did I say the voltage meant? It's the difference between the voltage inside the cell and outside the cell. So if it's positive inside the cell, that means there's a lot more positive ions in the cell and you wanna force them out. But they can only get forced out through channels that are open. And right now in this phase of the action potential, what we call the downstroke, right? Or the repolarization, the potassium channels are open. This is also known as repolarization. And one more thing, a very specific term, hyperpolarization. Why is it called hyperpolarization? Because remember, negative 70 millivolts was the resting potential, right? But are we at negative 70 millivolts anymore? No, we're hanging out down by like negative 80, negative 85, right? So what gives? Why wouldn't the neuron just go straight back to rest? It's because the, the voltage-gated potassium channels, remember how I said the sodium channels were quick to close? What do you guys think these are? Slow to close. These are slow to close. So instead of snapping open, snapping shut, they snap open, and then they're like, uh, uh, we're, we're gonna close, it, it's gonna happen, oh my god, and then they close, right? So since they're given so much time before they close, and the potassium concentration is so much higher inside the cell than outside the cell, 
a lot of potassium leaves the cell. And almost too much of it leaves the cell. So it hyperpolarizes. All right, cool. This is known as hyperpolarization. It's too negative now, right? So in order to get back to resting potential, we have to go through number four. So sodium, potassium, ATPase, or what's called a sodium potassium pump, activates to restore membrane potential. Remember sodium potassium pumps? Three sodium out, two potassium in, right? And since you're kicking out, or whatever it is, something in that direction, but it's, it's three sodium for two potassium, right? So since you're doing that, you're reestablishing this sort of gradient, and slowly over time, it levels back out to resting potential. What does this have to do with signal transmission? Everything, this is the signal. This is the electric signal that is getting translated down the line. So when we talked about before, look back in your notes, if you drew out the whole axon like thing, whatever, if you didn't, I have a photo of it right here, right? So this is actually from the book, this is what it looks like. So if you look over here, right, that signal is gonna start here and propagate and propagate and propagate and the action potential happens at those different points in the neuron. What are those points called? The nodes of Ranvier. I'm like checking to see if my microphone's still on because last week my fucking microphone died. An hour and 15 minutes, I have to re-record 45 minutes of the lecture. It sucks. All right, so it propagates, propagates, propagates until we get the axon. At the end of the axon, it gets translated into a chemical signal, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, right? But that is the signal, right? Let's talk about specifics of what's special about this signal. The hyperpolarization. So there's a specific thing, and I, I make this connection all the time because the MCAT also wants to know this, but they don't really talk about it. Um, there's something called a refractory period. Okay, so when men climax, when men ejaculate, right, they are unable to do so for a certain number of minutes or maybe even hours until after they're done, right? That is known as a refractory period. In the same sense, the neuron is refractory inside of the time that it is hyperpolarized. It cannot send another signal, right? So this is known as the refractory period, uh, the time that it's getting back up to resting potential. Because you can't really wake it up until it's back at resting potential. So it cannot send another signal. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. This happens not even in seconds. This happens in fractions of fractions of fractions of seconds. Right? They, remember, quick, quicker than you can ever believe. All right. Now, can I erase some stuff on the side over here? Because I just want you guys to look at this. So. There's two different types of refractory periods. Number one is an absolute refractory period. So this is no signal at all. No matter how much, how many incoming signals the dendrites are processing, there's no action potential at all. The neuron's asleep. It's, it's in a coma. It is practically dead. You don't even know it's breathing. It's not happening, right? Does anyone know the name of the other refractory period? There's an absolute refractory period and a relative refractory period. A relative refractory period. The neuron will only respond to a strong enough signal. So if you, if you poke the neuron, nothing's gonna happen. If you take a machete and chop its arm off, maybe it'll send a signal. Now what do I mean by that? Okay, this part's phase one right here, right? Phase one actually kind of looks like this. So we're at resting, everyone like, Squint your eyes and really zoom in because I don't have much space over here. So it's receiving signals on the dendrite, right? And those signals may go like this, and like that, and then like that. And like, it's like little humps, right? They add together, right? So that's a small signal. So if you're in this period right here where it's coming back to resting potential, and you get a really small signal, it's just going to come straight back down. But if you get a huge signal, you might just kick straight up to threshold potential and get the rest of the action potential, right? Because once you're here, you're gone. Does that make sense? Okay, right? 
So now, going back to that all or nothing principle, right? So it's possible that you get a bunch of signals on the dendrites, but all of them only add up to like this. And this is threshold potential right here. They only add up to this, you fall straight back down. Or they only add up to this, you fall straight back down. But the moment they all add up to this, you're flying. Does that make sense? All or nothing. If you do not get up to threshold potential, you do not get a signal. Does that make sense? Take a photo of the board, everyone. Yeah, what's up? Huh? Oh, so the neuron will only respond to a strong enough signal. A strong enough signal. So the absolute refractory period is very early in the hyperpolarization. The relative refractory period is very late in the hyperpolarization. Does that make sense? Very cool. And this is how we propagate signals throughout a neuron. This is through the neuron. What happens when we get to the end of the neuron? This feels so cool because like, I always used to watch lecturers and like, watch their lectures and stuff like that and see how they completely fill the board with information. And now like, I'm doing it and it feels cool. It feels nice. Because I've, I've, like, I've been doing this in my little man cave of a room since it's like 2020. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it feels good. Are we all done? Does anyone else want to take a photo of the board before it goes away forever? Forever hold your peace? All right, part of history now. What time is it? Oh my god. Dude, time really flies when you're up here. That's crazy. Okay. Okay, so I, I have the six steps right here the way I wrote them. So the cell reaches threshold potential. Voltage-gated sodium channels open in response to depolarization. You reach <coughs> positive 35. The sodium channels close, and the, and the potassium channels open. The voltage-gated potassium channels hyperpolarize the neuron, and then the Na plus K plus ATPase, or sodium potassium pump, activates and restores resting potential. OK, the reason I call it Na plus K plus ATPase and not a sodium potassium pump is because when people call it sodium potassium pumps, they forget that it uses ATP. So whenever someone says, if any of my lecturers say sodium potassium pump, I write this, so that I always remember that it uses ATP. Fun fact, greater than 50% of the ATP you will ever produce goes into these pumps. That's how important they are throughout your body. Okay. By the way, for impulse propagation, you know how I said that the, the signal that jumps through the nodes of Ron VA? There's a specific name for that. Does anyone know it? Good job, Sasha. Catch. Nice. It is known as saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction. And that is when the impulse quote unquote, jumps from node to node. Saltatory conduction. We need to talk about neurotransmitters and the synapse. Oh my god. Guys, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm fucking dying up here. <laughs> I'm so tired. All right, so this, again, what was this and what was this at the, at the end of the last thing? So this is very, very zoomed in. This is the axon terminal, right? And this is the dendrite. And these neurons have specific names. This is the presynaptic neuron, and this is the postsynaptic neuron. So creative. The one before the synapse is called the presynaptic neuron. And the one that's postsynaptic, or the one that's after the synapse is called the postsynaptic neuron, right? Pre and post. Cool. Neurotransmitters are stored, right, in membrane bound vesicles of the presynaptic neuron in order to be released. So these are little vesicles, and there are neurotransmitters stored inside of here.
And what happens is that when the signal reaches here, there is an influx of calcium, right? There is a calcium influx into the neuron that pushes these neurotransmitters out into the synapse, right? Good? Understood? Yeah, so once action potential reaches the nerve terminal, voltage-gated ca uh, calcium channels open, allowing ca calcium to flow into the cell. And this pushes the vesicles out to fuse with the membrane, neurotransmitters release into the synapse, right? <coughs> so when you study general biology and you learn more about vesicles than I taught you, you will realize that vesicles are just little membranes floating around, little balls of membrane. And what happens is that when they get pushed, they fuse with this part of the membrane. They fuse. Like, this, mem this membrane, it opens up and it becomes an integral part of the rest of the membrane here and here, and then it pushes the neurotransmitters out. Can you guys imagine that? So look at this. A little ball, right? And there's the membrane right there. It fuses like this, and when it grows out, it spits out the neurotransmitters, right? Does, does that make sense? You guys can imagine that, right? So those neurotransmitters are spit out into what? What's this? The synaptic cleft, right? So the neurotransmitters, so look. Action potential leads to calcium influx. Can't spell. Leads to neurotransmitter release into synaptic cleft. I know it's very small. So action potential leads to calcium influx, leads to neurotransmitter release into synaptic cleft. Does that make sense? Yes? Cool. Once the neurotransmitters are here, what do you think exists on the dendrite? We have molecules and we have receptors. We have receptors. And the neurotransmitter will fit into the receptor and produce an excitatory potential inside of this neuron. And if we have an excitatory potential that's strong enough in the neuron, what will happen? An action potential will travel down this neuron and the next neuron, the neurotransmitters will be released onto that. And if the potential is large enough, it will depolarize and create, sorry, another action potential. That was probably really gross for the microphone. I like burped in the middle of fucking speaking. Okay, so neurotransmitters attach, depolarize if it's an excitatory potential, and then relay it onto the next neuron and the next neuron and the next neuron until there is a neuron that fires onto something else, like a muscle or an effector organ or something, right? And those neurotransmitters are special, right? Those neurons hold special neurotransmitters in order to create changes inside of the target tissue. Does that make sense? Is everyone following here? Do you, can you kind of imagine, can you map out how a potential moves through the nervous system. You guys get that? Okay. One very important thing, right, to talk about, and we're going to talk about the types of receptors later. We're going to get to that in like later in the chapter, later in the book. Um, but one thing we're going to talk about is the mechanisms by which neurotransmitters, their signals are stopped or continued, right? Because you can't just have this shit all the time. You can't, just, you can't just have neurotransmitters firing on receptors all the time. So there's three things that can happen. So are you guys okay with this? I'm going to erase, right? Cool. So what are the three things that can happen in order for an enzymatic, or sorry, a neurotransmitter, I just gave you one of the answers, in order for neurotransmitters to stop firing. So the first one is enzyme breakdown. Enzyme breakdown, right? So the neurotransmitter is broken down by an enzyme. And if it's broken down, it can no longer bind to the receptor, right? And if it can't bind to the receptor, it can't produce any signal. Does that make sense? Cool. Very cool. Number two, 
and we're going to talk about this one in a second. I'm going to ask you guys a very, very large, over-the-top Jolly Rancher question, so prepare yourselves. This is called reuptake. And if you already know the question I'm going to ask, shut the fuck up. So, this is when the presynaptic neuron will take back the neurotransmitter. will take back the neurotransmitter. It'll bring it back into itself and recycle it and use it again. What's the last thing? So it can either get broken down or taken back, right? Or what? It can leave. Diffusion. It leaves. So here's the synaptic cleft, all the neurotransmitters, they leave. That's it. And they get broken down somewhere else in the body. <clears throat> so there's, an end, there's, a, there's a disease in the body. It is called pheochromocytoma. <clears throat> it is a specific type of tumor. For anyone who's seen House MD, they talk about it all the time, right? A pheochromocytoma is a neurotransmitter releasing tumor and it releases epinephrine and all that stuff and all these like hormones that kind of upregulate your sympathetic nervous system, right? And one big way we diagnose it is by looking at the breakdown products in the urine. So we look for homovanillic acid and venylomandelic acid and we look for these breakdown products of epinephrine in the urine. And if we see a lot of breakdown products, that must mean there was a lot of neurotransmitter in there, right? And if it's too much, if it's outside of the normal amount, it might be a tumor. So that's important in enzyme breakdown. Here's your Jolly Rancher question. In patients who are depressed, patients with depression, they take a specific class of medications called SSRIs. Has anyone ever heard of these? SSRIs, right? Maybe some of you have been on them, right? It's very common, right? Very common medication that's prescribed. I know a lot of people who have been on SSRIs. Right? These are known as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And another one is called an NDRI, a norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor. I want you to tell me why these work to reduce the symptoms of depression. Given only the information I've given you, I want you to tell me how they work. You're both correct. Can you catch? Oh, fuck. You're so damn far away. All right. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors inhibit the reuptake channel of serotonin in the presynaptic neuron. When this happens, serotonin is allowed to stay inside of the synaptic, synaptic cleft for longer. And if it can stay in the cleft for longer, it can act for longer and increase feelings of happiness and combat depression. Same thing with norepinephrine and dopamine. That is how these drugs work. Understood? Very good, good job guys. Don't go asking your therapist for SSRIs, just because I said so. I will find out. So we talked a little bit about um, the organization of the central and peripheral nervous system. Um, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about, about like more specific organizations there. So let's talk about the CNS and the PNS. We have to talk about the words afferent and efferent. Afferent arrives. It brings signals into 
the central nervous system. So an afferent neuron is when I touch my finger right here, what is telling my brain that I'm being touched, that's the afferent neuron. It is arriving, the signal is arriving at the brain, at the central nervous system. The efferent exits. Whenever my brain needs to send a signal to a muscle to contract, that is sent by an efferent neuron. The efferent exits. Sends signal to periphery. Interneurons are found between other neurons, and they're located specifically in the spinal cord, and they usually control reflexive behavior, right? So basically, like, if I touch a hot stove, right, uh, that signal will be transported into my spinal cord, right? And in the spinal cord, that's a neuron that's going to fire back, but also relay the, cord, the thing up to the brain, the message up to the brain. So this is my spinal cord right here. And what that does is you'll realize that if you ever touch something that's hot, you'll pull your hand away before you can feel the pain. That's because of an interneuron. That's the, that's the reflex that happens, right? Sometimes, like, when you're walking and your leg buckles, you'll, like, go like this before you can realize that you're tripping. That's another interneuron. It comes up to the bottom of the spinal cord and fires back, and then it sends the signal at the same time. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so the efferent, it exits, and it sends the signal to the periphery. Sends the signal to the periphery, right? Uh, we talked about reflexes, and then blah, 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 blah. OK. Let's talk about some more divisions, right? So we have the nervous system, right? And the nervous system is obviously split into central and peripheral. The peripheral nervous system is further split into somatic and autonomic. Somatic is what's under your control. So I'm able to make a fist. I'm able to flick my finger. I'm able to lick my lips. I'm able to talk. I'm able to move my head. That is somatic, right? Autonomic nervous system is everything that's not under your control. My breathing, my ventilation, my heart rate, right? My digestion, right? Certain smooth muscles that are moving throughout my body, my vasculature. Those things are autonomic. And the autonomic is split into two divisions as well. What are those two divisions known as? The most famous thing you hear in like every psychology course about the nervous system. Sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic and parasympathetic. So, like I said, the somatic nervous system consists of sensory and motor neurons distributed throughout the skin, joints, and mu the muscles. There's sensory neurons, afferent, information, blah, 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 right? So that's like sensation and control of whatever's going on. Autonomics, right, are gener they generally regulate the heartbeat, respiration, digestion, glandular secretions, like how quickly you secrete hormones and blah, 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 and everything like that, right? It is independent of conscious control, right? And two very specific terms. In the, in the autonomic system, there's two neurons in the pathway. The first one is called the preganglionic, and the second one is called the postganglionic. And the ganglion is just this collection of cell bodies that helps to process the information. Pre, I'm going to write it bigger over here. So preganglionic and postganglionic. Right? Cool. There is a misconception among students everywhere that the nervous system, the parasympathetic and sympathetic branches, antagonize one another. Well, they do. They do, right? But that one is active and the other one's just off. And that one is off and the other one's active. Like, that's not true. There is a level of sympathetic tone and parasympathetic tone that can be modulated at all times. 
So in times of stress, when I'm about to walk into an exam or walk up to race a race or walk up to do a certain procedure or something, right? My sympathetic tone increases, right? And right after I've had a meal, if I'm laying down in bed, if I'm relaxing, my parasympathetic tone increases and my sympathetic tone decreases. It's like controlling the volume on a little DJ turntable, right? So it's not that they are always against one another. They just function to do different things. So the parasympathetic nervous system, its goal is to conserve energy. To conserve energy, right? And it's associated with resting, lowering the heart rate, constricting the bronchi, right? Sleeping, stuff like that. One of those things isn't like the other. Why did I say constricting the bronchi? Well, when do you need it to be a lot easier to breathe? You need it to be easier to breathe when you're doing a lot of heavy exercise, right? Right? So the sympathetic system dilates the bronchi. The parasympathetic system relaxes them. You don't always want them to be breathing at like 100% efficiency. You don't always want something on, right? So, and this is mainly controlled by a, a neurotransmitter known as acetylcholine or ACH. One big thing, it increases digestion, right? And the sympathetic system is activated by stress. That's not to say that your sympathetic system doesn't activate every single day. When you wake up, getting your body moving, getting your heart rate back up, getting you to be alert, that's all sympathetic stuff. That's technically stress, right? It's just not resting, right? And the main neurotransmitter here is epinephrine, and norepinephrine. Epinephrine, norepinephrine. Listen to the things. Increase heart rate, increase blood flow to muscles, increase blood glucose, decrease digestion, dilate the pupils, relax the bronchi, and increase body epinephrine. These all sound like things when you're getting ready to beat the shit out of someone. Because that's what it is. It's fight or flight, right? Either you're gonna fight or you're gonna book it, right? Epinephrine also increases glucose metabolism, which we're gonna talk about later when we get to biochem. There's so many things that happen in the sympathetic response within metabolism, right? Talk about reflex arcs a little bit and blah, blah, blah. And um, I don't think reflex arcs are that important, but we kind of talked about it, how it like hits the spinal cord, comes back, and then sig signals the rest of the brain. Um, and if we're not gonna talk about reflex arcs, that's it. That's the nervous system. It's a lot more tame than you guys would have th thought, right? But there is one more thing I want to talk about before you guys leave. Talk I'm going to talk about biochemical warfare. Yeah, guys, I'm like your MCAT tutor is just going to go on a complete random tangent and teach you about something that's completely unrelated to the test. Sarin gas is a biochemical agent. It is a biochemical agent. And it is something known as an ache eye. Like that, ache eye. And I'm going to explain what that means in a second. What has to happen for you to breathe? What set of muscular and nervous pathways need to be activated and deactivated for you to breathe? Well, the phrenic nerve needs to send a signal to the diaphragm, right? And the diaphragm receives that signal through the parasympathetic system normally, right? And it receives that signal via the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Okay? So acetylcholine reaches the diaphragm and it causes contraction. Contraction of the diaphragm. Where's the diaphragm? It's right here. It's this little like 
globe-looking thing on top of your liver and your stomach and everything. And when the diaphragm contracts, it pushes down, right? What does that make room for? The lungs. So the lungs can open up and inflate. So it takes up less space in the thorax so that the lungs can inflate. So when the diaphragm contracts, the lungs fill. And then when the acetylcholine is broken down, right? ACH broken down. The diaphragm relaxes. And when the diaphragm relaxes, it pushes back up. The lungs empty. And that causes you to exhale. ACH breakdown is monitored by an enzyme known as acetylcholine esterase or ache E, or sorry, ACE, -E, ache, right? A C H E, ache. If you inhibit this enzyme, you are known as an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. And that's what sarin gas is it's an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, an ache I. So when people use this gas against other people and they breathe it in, they are breathing in a molecule that inhibits acetylcholine. And if you inhibit, sorry, in, uh, inhibits acetylcholine esterase, right? And if you inhibit acetylcholine esterase, you don't get the ACH breakdown, right? Remember, this is number one of, really, of breaking down neurotransmitters or stopping their signaling. So if you don't break down acetylcholine, it will constantly fire on the diaphragm. And if it constantly fires on the diaphragm, the diaphragm will stay constricted and your lungs will never relax. You will die because you can't exhale. Your blood will become acidotic. Your entire body will get no oxygen and you will choke to death on your own breath. That's how sarin nerve gas works. So that was like number, we've already spoke about number two, right? The, the reuptake. This is number one the breakdown. So what happens is that acetylcholine esterase breaks down the acetylcholine so that it can no longer fire on the postsynaptic neuron. And that causes the relaxation. And if that didn't happen, you would die. Thank you guys so much for listening. I will have this uploaded very soon, along with a little, like, the little sheets and like, any corrections that I find uh, next time. So we're done with four chapters. We're moving quick. Next time, I'm going to introduce you guys to some study methods. I'm going to teach you guys how to use Anki, like what it is, how to approach it, how to sort of like organize all this information in your head. Um, and other than that, I would like for you guys to be proud of yourselves because you're keeping up and you're doing great. So thank you for coming, and I'll see you on Thursday, same time. No problem.